Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 27th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaska for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the first two big votes this session tell us everything about where it's going to end up. Along the way in our discussion of that, we also touch on the governor's state of the state address and Americans for Prosperity Alaska's new ad campaign. Our second issue is a recent op-ed from Tom Brennan that seems to argue the fiscal solution is all one way or the other. That overlooks what we think is a much better all of the above approach. And third, the Legislative Finance Division claims to be nonpartisan, but the legislature just appointed someone who's one of the most partisan on the key issue of the day. And now, let's join Michael. Well, all right. Well, let's get uh, let's get into number one. Number one on your topics for today of the weekly top three. Start off with, uh, you know, that we could see the end result already of the session. I'm already predicting it's going to be one of the nastiest sessions out there. But you're also saying that it's just going to be more ad hoc co- uh, ad hoc cuts to the PFD. And that, uh, I think, comes directly out of this fracturing of the Senate. It does. I mean, there's there's two things that sort of tell you where we're going. One was the reorganization of the Senate, uh, the, the demotion of the... Uh, the Valley uh, conservatives to uh, lesser positions in the caucus, um, it, removing them from removing Shelley and Laura and uh, and Mike Shower from uh, their uh, their chairmanships and and removing Shower from uh, and Macheki from uh, from Senate Finance. So the so the Natasha Burt uh, uh, control uh, of the Senate Finance is more complete. Um, so that that tells you that that the leadership, the Senate leadership, uh, is is committed to not doing anything to raise revenues from the top twenty percent and continue to focus uh, on PFD cuts. At the same time, uh, I think the veto override vote uh, showed us that there are enough votes um, in the uh, in the legislature to to support the governor in vetoing anything like a permanent PFD cut that's not matched with, uh, with other uh, solutions that, that solve, uh, solve the overall fiscal problem um, and, uh, is, and, and is there to support the governor, that there's enough in the, in the, in the legislature there to support the governor to, uh, to, to stop uh, the majority from uh, going off the deep end and trying to shove all of the, all of the solution off permanently, all of the solution off on PFD cuts. And what I think that means is there there isn't enough votes either way to find a permanent solution this session, uh, because the the Senate majority has shown that the only permanent solution they're interested in is PFD cuts, uh, continued PFD cuts, deep PFD cuts, and I think the uh, the veto override shows us there's enough there in the legislature to support the, the governor, uh, who I would expect would veto any legislation that was that was dependent on permanent deep PFD cuts. And I, and that gets you to the end of the session with, uh, with no other solutions having been worked out, uh, because the Senate majority would oppose it. Um, and, and so the, the, the knee jerk at the end of the session, the one thing they could get to, the one thing the legislature can get to that the governor can't affect is, uh, is financing the budget off of PFD cuts. Um, and I, and I, you know, there, there are a lot of things that can happen during a session, but I think those two fundamental positions 
one, the Senate majority is not interested in doing anything in, in doing anything other than PFD cuts, and two, that there's enough to uphold enough in the legislature to uphold the governor blocking any permanent solution based on deep PFD cuts. I think that tells you that we get to the that we get to the end, and that's we just end up where we've ended up before. There's not enough uh, one way or the other, uh, and we ride through the end of the year. Uh, uh, they, they predicate the budget through the end of the year on uh, on, on making temporary PFD cuts. You know, Brad. Uh, the more I think about this, that you know, I'm just so I'm so chagrined because you know, in the past, uh, it, you know, any touch to the PFD in the past historically, prior to four years ago, was like an uh, you know like an utter death sentence to a politician. It was like the third rail of Alaskan politics, and now they just kind of blithely go through it. Do you think the PFD cuts? As they continue in this discussion now of just taking the PFD, do you think it's going to have a bigger impact this election cycle if you were to uh, if you were a betting man and were to you know hold the envelope up to your forehead? What do you think? I think there are ways to position it uh, that way. The, the governor the governor's sort of got himself in a trap, though. I mean he's he, he's opposed to PFD cuts, but he's not being proactive in 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 other ways, other revenue forms. Uh, to try to to try to close the fiscal gap. So we so if he doesn't change that, what we go into this election cycle with is the governor continuing to talk about deep spending cuts because if he doesn't talk about other revenues, that's really all he's got. Um, and and you know and and opposing uh, PFD cuts. I, I I think I think I think we get to a, an election that's muddled. Uh, if the governor were prepared to to, to Back up his ten-year plan. Back up the OMB ten-year plan. And say, here's the scenarios. We need to resolve it based on these scenarios, and <clears throat> I'm willing to consider uh, some form of new revenues as part of an overall conclu- uh, as part of an overall solution that includes spending cuts. <clears throat> Excuse me, Michael. That in- includes deep spending cuts. If he were prepared to say that, then I then I think we get we get into this election. Um, uh, a lot cleaner, uh, with a with a lot clearer choice. But as long as he's as he's boxing himself in by not talking about new revenues and really only talking about spending cuts, I'm not sure we get any clarity out of this election. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. So uh, looking like again, this session is going to be loud, obnoxious, and in the long run, we're going to have more cuts to the PFD because that's really the only thing that's on the table, the only thing that they're really looking at. Final thought. Yeah, exactly right. I think that's I think that's exactly where uh, where this all ends up. You can just see the forces at work uh, in the first two votes, the the reorganization of the Senate, and in the veto override. You can see those forces at work, and I think I think that's exactly where we end up. So, what are your thoughts here on the uh, what are your thoughts on the governor's state of the state and the reaction that we've seen so far? Well, the state of the state. Um, I, I, I would have done it differently uh, than the governor. The governor, the governor's uh, Office of Management and Budget, OMB, published what I continue to think is a great 10-year plan, a, t- a great 10-year outlook uh, on where the state's headed, and had several scenarios in there with different options. One, one's cuts only. Another is uh, 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 taxes. Another is PFD cuts only, and, and, and on and on. If I were the governor, I would have said, "Read my OMB, read my read my ten-year uh, plan book. These are the options we're dealing with. If you've got other options, we can throw them in there. But but let's get serious about about this fiscal situation. And here's the options we're dealing with. And what we ought to spend this session doing is talking about those options, those scenarios, and coming to grips with." With the solutions that uh, that work, the solutions that solve solve the whole thing, um, I think I think he largely wasted the opportunity by not talking about those. And in particular, I was disappointed with with sort of the only fiscal uh, proposal out there being the uh, 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 the lottery. Uh, the Governor uh, Walker's task force uh, revenue department estimated that at 15 million uh, last year. Uh, department of Revenue estimated at 8 million. It's it's not a solution to anything. It's a it's a it's a penny in the penny in the till type thing. So I I I I, I, I was disappointed 
at the wasted opportunity of focusing on his OMB tenure plan. I think that's a great document. I think it's a great guideline on how we resolve this situation uh, in terms of, of laying out the various scenarios. And I would and I wish he would have spent more time on that. Well, and and I think that that could have been, uh, you know, that could have been fruitful as well. But at the same time, I mean, I think he was trying to point out and call for the I mean, I was really appreciative of him saying, look, we need to reinforce the uh, we need to reinforce the trust in government and try and get back to that with people. I thought that that was a uh, uh, I thought that that was a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, uh, a good call. Uh, but again, it seems like nobody in the legislature has any interest in allowing the the uh, you know the citizens to sound off on it. Yeah, Jennifer Johnson's reaction was was just classic top twenty percent. Uh, she said something along the lines of in the, in the comments afterwards that I don't think anybody's in the mood for, uh, or I'm not in the mood for for new revenues. Well. We have new revenues. It's just that they're coming from the other 80%. They're coming from middle and lower income Alaska families. And she's all in favor of that. In fact, she's all in favor of increasing those uh, new revenues by taxing the PFD and raising funds for middle and, and, and lower income Alaska families. Right. Uh, what she doesn't want to do is raise revenues from from her uh, top 20%. And, and it's unfortunate that she's gotten in this position. I mean, Jennifer Johnson comes from the wealthiest legislative district in the state without question far and away the wealthiest uh, district in the state and what and what it's become clear she's there to do is protect the top 20 percent to protect her district uh and and the, and those in the top 20 percent um in other districts and and i think that's uh, that's a problem because she's going to stall on anything that would that would that would have the top 20 percent contributing to the to the state in the same way they're trying to force middle and lower income Alaska families uh, to contribute to the state solution. So um, it, the, the, the reaction was disappointing. as well. uh, Yesterday we had on Ryan McKee, who is the director of uh, Alaskans uh, or excuse me, Americans for Prosperity Alaska. Uh, and they have a campaign that they're calling True North, where they're putting out uh, what they're calling educational videos. He came on yesterday to talk about constitutional uh, amendments, including spending caps, uh, the, and uh, and but when pressed on it, was very vague about it. We played the ad before the interview, and then we dissected it after the interview. Uh, and I had a few legitimate concerns and things to say about it. Brad said he's seen the uh, interview and he wants to talk a little bit about it. Brad, what are your thoughts on this True North campaign you're seeing from AFP? Yeah, it sort of it sort of makes apparent something that uh, something that I, has been in the background. Um, uh, a long time with respect to AFP and uh, and and something that I sort of knew was lurking back there, but it sort of comes out uh, in this video. This video uh, has a passage in it that says, uh, or their ad has a passage in it that says, uh, basically, uh, the legislature did a great job cutting spending last year. Uh, now we've got it uh, uh, under control. Uh, we've got a path going forward. Uh, and and we ought to support uh, uh, the Governor Dunleavy and and the legislature in following that path. Well, the only way you can believe that, the only way that's true, is if you think that PFD cuts uh, that the PFD um, is part of spending, not part of uh, not 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 something that goes to Alaskans, but the the full PFD is part of state government that uh, state government gives a portion out uh, at its whim. Um, if you believe the PFD is part of revenue, then then yes, uh, the state's back in balance. The cuts last year got us below, uh, got us with inside spending with inside revenue, including PFD revenue. Uh, and and if you believe that the PFD is unimportant, uh, then then uh, continue on out. Basically, um, what this is 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 the Ala uh, Americans for Prosperity Alaska saying we support the top 20% solution. Right. We support we support using uh, PFD cuts and PFD revenue to support government. We've now gotten with the cuts we made last year. We've now gotten within. Uh, we, we've now gotten spending down below the revenue that includes PFD. All you need to do is put a spending cap on. Continue to use the PFDs as, as government revenue, and and you've got the situation. You got the situation solved. I I knew this was in the back of, of AFP's mind. Stephen Moore, uh, who uh, has a national uh, reputation, uh, certainly 
uh, came to speak in Alaska a couple of years ago, three years ago, um, and in discussions around that speech made clear that he didn't think much of the PFD, uh, that he didn't think it was a, a legitimate uh, approach, that he was concerned about uh, about those distributions to uh, Alaska citizens, didn't think it was something that needed needed to be protected. Uh, and I wondered at the time when this was going to pop back out uh, as part of AFP's position, and it's clear now that it has. Uh, basically, what they're saying is we're on board with the Natasha Von Imhoff's, the Kathy Geisels, uh, the, the uh, 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 Jennifer Johnston's, uh, the top 20%, uh, in their view of how we ought to be running government, in their view uh, that revenues – uh, should include PFD revenues, and and we think we've reached a solution because we don't think the PFD is important. And uh, and that's, you know, I, 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 it, it's it, it's nothing more than just formalizing the alliance between the Americans for, for Prosperity and the top twenty percent Republicans. Well, and I think uh, part of that is, of course, is that the, it, those top twenty percent Republicans are all kind of woven into the fabric of AFP Alaska. I mean, there's some ties there to the Kelly and. Uh, and, and others that I think just kind of lay out and show that. I mean, I dissected that that video phrase by phrase yesterday. It took me about five minutes to go through it. But, I mean, it, you know, two-thirds of it were essentially, uh, you know, if not mis- misrepresentations, kind of blatant falsehoods on, on really on the part of it when you read into it. And, and I just, I, you know, I, I kind of take offense at that when they say, look, the, the, the danger's passed. Just do what you're continuing to do and everything will be fine is kind of the the end result of this with really no mention of a constitutional spending limit or anything else, which is what they're trying to push. And I I was just disappointed. I I guess I'll put it that way, because I I think AFP has been done some good across the country. But this is definitely not something that I think is uh, is, is, you know, lives up to that to that uh, idea. I got about 35 seconds here, Brad. Well, it's it's uh, it, it is disappointing. I mean, AFP sells itself as a conservative organization, and in some ways it is, but it's conservative in the sense that it's aligned with the top 20%. It's not conservative in the sense that it's trying to do the best for all Alaskans. They're trying to they're trying to protect the top, as, as Natasha and Kathy and others are trying to do, they're just trying to protect the top 20% Alaskans. As we move on from number one to number two, uh, Tom Brennan, who, uh, uh, who wrote an opinion piece in The Frontiersman here recently, Talks about uh, the Alaska Permanent Fund itself, and you know, making a, making a, a, a I guess he's making a pitch here for not paying the full PFD. And you think that he is, uh, you know, he has it wrong that the long term answer isn't one or the other; it's a combination of taxes. And you know, give us your take on this. Well, so Brennan Brennan writes this piece, and and basically he says there are three options. One is cutting the PFD. Uh, the second is. Uh, uh, dipping into the earnings reserve and and financing, well, four options. The first is cutting the PFD. Second is dipping into the reserve uh, and financing it out of savings. Uh, The third is making cuts to spending. And the fourth is new taxes. And then he says the only one of those options most of us could live with is a dividend check of a size that does not follow the 1982 formula but could be written without endangering critical permanent fund accounts, in other words, uh, PFD cuts. I think Tom and, and others, uh, and, and maybe myself in the past, are getting it wrong by saying there's only one solution. It's either PFD cuts or new taxes or uh, uh, spending cuts. It has to be one of those three. And I think, I think we're, we're, we're missing the boat by saying it has to be one of those three. I think all three, I think the solution – is found in in using all three together, and that's what the governor's scenario five uh, in the OMB uh, ten year plan does. It uses all three uh, in finding a solution. It does uh, uh, PFD restructuring to uh, POMV fifty fifty, which I think is an acceptable uh, 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 approach. It cuts uh, nearly seven hundred million, six hundred and fifty million. Uh, out of spending from the inf- spending plus inflation line cuts it down 650 million actually a negative uh, uh, real uh, growth in uh, in the budget or, or a real reduction in the budget over the 10-year period and uh, it uh, it funds part of it uh, from 
uh, other taxes, uh, other revenue sources other than additional PFD cuts. That sort of what the governor's OMB 10-year plan refers to as the balanced approach, I think that's ultimately the solution uh, that that's going to work. And I and I'm and I'm growing frustrated with columns like Tom's. Uh, I respect the heck out of Tom Brennan, but but columns like Tom's that that sort of say it has to be one or the other. Uh, that it's going to be we're either going to do it through PFT cuts or we're going to do it through spending cuts or we're going to do it through uh, other revenues uh, or draws from uh, draws from savings as long as savings last last. I, that's not going to get the solution. To get to the solution, we're going to have to do all of the above. Uh, I found it interesting that in his commentary in here, he goes, the case uh, can be made, it seems fair, uh, except that it would require either a huge dip in the earnings reserve account of the permanent fund or major cut, this is the quote, or major cuts to the already lean state budget. And, and, and this seems to be a common thread in a lot of the the cries where people who are advocating for this kind of thing, that the state is already lean and mean. It just couldn't be cut anymore, to which... I mean, I just kind of shake my head. I mean, maybe there's no political will to cut it, but to say that the state is a lean budget when we're we're already at two, two and a half times what the national average is and we've got all these other things going on. I mean, I just see this mantra being repeated over and over again, but it doesn't make it true. Yeah, I, exactly right. And but but it shows how it shows how widespread the mantra has become. Tom Brennan uh, uh, is 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 a conservative. I mean, he founded the the when the when the two daily papers in Anchorage merged, he founded the Voice of the Times, uh, helped found the Voice of the Times uh, editorial page that was very conservative, uh, and runs a conservative website now. Uh, yeah. Yet he's yet he's seeing, saying something like this. Working on our weekly top three, we were just finishing up with two of three, which was this discussion from Tom Brennan, his opinion piece in the Frontiersman, uh, kind of the same thing that we've seen this recycled mantra of. Uh, you know, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't have to tax to pay the dividend, use the dividend of all the options. It's kind of a false choice when it's all said and done. Uh, your best and, 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 and highest choice at this time is just to continue to do what you do, which is basically uh, cut into the dividend and use those taxes. Um, Brad, final thoughts on number two here. Well, it ties into it ties into my sort of my critique of the of the governor's state of the state uh, address last night. We, we need to, we need to have a, a broader discussion that starts focusing on all of the above, starts focusing on using all of the tools at our disposal to resolve this fiscal situation rather than saying, Oh, it's gotta be just this, this, this particular piece, which is, you know, spending cuts or this particular piece, which is PFD cuts or this particular piece, which some people argue, uh, which is, uh, which is other taxes or this particular piece, which is just writing, uh, savings down until we, until we use them all up. I, I, the, the governor, I think, as I said earlier, the governor, I think, missed an opportunity last night to, to focus on his, the 10 year plan that OMB put out uh, for him, for the administration and say, look, here are our options. Uh, this is where we, this is what we not need to be talking about. We need to be talking about uh, these scenarios and coming to coming to a solution on one. And it, in the perfect world, if I had, had been the governor, or if I could could advise the governor on what to say, it would have been. And let's look at scenario five, which is all the above. All Alaskans make a little bit of a sacrifice uh, in order to uh, in order to accomplish the the goal of of, of moving us forward. Tom's piece, um, Tom Brennan's piece, uh, has the same problem uh, from my standpoint. It's, 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 it, it assumes that there has to be, there, there can only be one solution. Only one, only one team wins. Uh, either the PFD cut team wins, or the spending cut team wins, uh, or the other tax team uh, wins. And and Tom says, well, in that in that case, uh, as he as he put it in the piece, the only one of these three options most of us could live with. Uh, is a PFD cut. I I think that's wrong. I think right. I think Alaskans as a whole could live with an all of the above solution, uh, and 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 find a way to resolve this situation uh, by doing that. As long as we keep focusing on it, has to be one or the other or the other. It can't be can't be that guy's uh, a solution. It can't be the other guy's solution. It has to be my solution. As long as we keep focusing on on only one solution to the to the problem. I don't think we ever get to a solution because because no one no one has the political power 
to strong on that again to go back to the votes earlier this session uh, uh, already in this session no one has the political power to slam to body slam the other one uh, down to uh, down to a solution it's going to take all of the pieces I think to bring us to a solution uh, Brad Keithley Alaska's for sustainable budgets our guest that's number two number three Pat Pitney as the new legislative finance director uh, that probably wouldn't have been your choice no. Um, so legislative finance is supposed to be nonpartisan, right? It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be, you know, just the facts, ma'am, uh, approach, uh, approach to government. Um, and, and without coming in without any particular bias, David Teal wasn't that, I mean, David Teal had a bias that you could see easily come through all of the analyses that ledge finance was, was doing. In my opinion, uh, David Teal's been part of the problem, not part of the solution. You go back to 2007, uh, 17 rather, and you see what Ledge Finance did in in change, changing the designation of the PFD from designated general funds to unrestricted general funds, and sort of the the the, the fallout of that. Uh, that that violated uh, Ledge Finance's own rules. I mean, Ledge Finance says designated general funds are funds that are designated by statute to a, to a certain purpose. The PFD is certainly that. Right. Uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, his ledge finance changed it from designated general funds to unrestricted general funds. I, that's not, it's not, it's not partisan in the sense that he was a, that he's a Democrat or a Republican. It's partisan in the sense that he's f- favoring one resolution over others. Um, and and essentially, the way I would break it down is is he's favoring the top twenty percent uh, Republican uh, solution to this issue rather than solutions that are beneficial to all Alaska families, work for all Alaska families, uh, and work for the overall Alaska economy. Um, Pat is is perfectly in line with David. What you're getting with with Pat is a continuation of the same approach that Teal had, maybe even ramped up a bit. It's hard to say that somebody's nonpartisan when they were the OMB director in a prior governor's administration. Um, and, and Pat certainly is bringing the, the, the perspectives and the, uh, the positions that she articulated uh, when she was the OMB director for Governor Walker, she's certainly bringing those to uh, to the ledge finance uh, 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 position, and and I think we're just going to see a continuation of the same sort of tilting uh, in ledge finance presentations uh, uh, from Pat that we saw under Teal. Uh, David, uh, 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 Alaska Public Media, uh, asked David to comment on Pat's appointment. Um, and, uh, and and David essentially gave gave him gave her uh, an endorsement. Um, Teal said Pitney is coming into the job at a time when lawmakers are grappling with contentious fiscal financial issues. I think we all this is Teal. I think we all know what the biggest thing is it is it's the dividends versus deficits trade off, right? He said, <laughs> "Well, it's not that. I mean, it is right. that if you're the top twenty percent. Well, and if and, you're advocating uh, a position, it sounds like the perfect place. Wait, I thought you were supposed to be not. I found it ironic that the first thing he said was, I don't think Pat's ever been partisan, uh, so she is not going to have a big problem. I mean, does you know, methinks he doth protest too much. You're the one bringing up all the partisan questions, and yet, and now you're advocating that it's a dividends versus deficit straight off. Yeah, it's 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 it's. I mean." They will defend it by saying, "Well, she's not a Democrat or Republican. She served in the independent in the independent governor's administration, uh, and so she's not really partisan in that sense. That's not the partisan that's counting on fiscal issues. The partisan breakdown on fiscal issues is really the top twenty percent Democrat coalition that I don't fully understand why the Democrats are going with the top twenty percent Republicans, but it's really the top twenty percent uh, Republican Democrat coalition against the other eighty percent, against the Republicans who represent the other eighty percent in the overall Alaska what we're, what's best in the interest of the Alaska economy. That's the partisan breakdown uh, on fiscal issues, and clearly, clearly, Pat is aligned. David was aligned, and Pat is aligned uh, with one side of that, and they tilt. They tilt their pre- David tilted his presentations. Ledge Finance tilted the way they treated revenue uh, in terms of redesignating the PFD as UGF. Clearly, they are tilting uh, the information going to the legislature 
uh, in that direction. And Pat is going to be just in line, uh, exactly in line with that uh, that going forward. So I find it I find it a very disappointing appointment uh, by by the legislature. Uh, uh, there were other qualified candidates, certainly, and I find it very disappointing to see them bringing in somebody who's 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 clearly aligned uh, with uh, with one side of this debate as opposed to having an open mind on all of the issues. About 90 seconds here, Brad. But again, this shouldn't be surprising because it's outcome based, right? They're looking for people who are going to give them the answers that kind of they're looking for. This was a known quantity, so this really shouldn't be that surprising. Am I wrong? I guess, but Chris Tuck is chairman of the of of the of the committee that made the decision. Chris Tuck says he's pro PFD. He wants to protect the PFD. Well, if you want to protect the PFD, the last thing you do is appoint somebody who says their their primary objective is to is to solve the fiscal situation by cutting the PFD. I mean, it's it, the inconsistency of what people are saying, like Chris Tuck, what people are saying their position is, and then what they're doing uh, is is stark. Um, and, and it leads to lack of trust in the legislature. I mean, they're talking out of one side of their mouth and they're, and they're making actions on the other side. So I, I, I expected more out of Chris Tuck. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I expected more out of Chris Tuck. We didn't get it. So I, I just wasn't surprised, Brad, when I saw this because all I could think of was, well, yeah, I mean, they're, again, they're looking for people who are in their can- and, and I know Chris Tuck has is, is advocated that he's a, you know, that he's a pro PFD guy, but at the same time, He's kind of, you know, allowing the 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 Bryce machine to run rampant uh, through everything. So, uh, you know, I think he can advocate while at the same time, you know, doing all these things that help support the what the majority uh, coalition majority wants. I mean, I, I just was not shocked by this appointment at all. Well, I, I was, um, and, and maybe you know, people want to say I'm naive about these things, but maybe I'm I, cynical. <laughs> maybe I'm just too cynical. <laughs> Well, but but I just I mean, Pat's great in terms of numbers. Pat's great in terms of understanding the detail. Pat's good in terms of of presentation. All the technical aspects uh, of of the job. She's not an economist, which is troubling, uh, because you really want somebody who's who understands the effects of these things as well as just the numbers. Uh, but but Pat's good at at all the technical detail. I'm not I'm not suggesting that she's not a good appointment from that standpoint. But in terms of partisanship, in terms of taking sides on the issue of the day uh, and on the issue that ledge finance concentrates on entirely, is involved in entirely, in terms of partisanship, she's clearly on one side of this. She is clearly on the the cutting the PFD as the solution side of this. And I, you know, I Ken Alper was a candidate for 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 the for the job, um, Ken is a former uh, was a director of the tax department under under Walker, and Ken's got a good feel for these uh, these things as well. But Ken is one of the proponents is on the committee for uh, the uh, the the oil initiative, the oil tax initiative, right? And and so I thought, well, you know, that should be just. Dis- and others said, well, that should be disqualifying for Ken because he's clearly on one side. Uh, of of the of how do we approach uh, revenue? Ken's actually good on PFDs and on other taxes, but but he's off on one side on the soil tax initiative, and and people discounted Ken uh, in part because of that. Well, okay, if you're going to do that, then then you should discount people who are on one side of the PFD cut uh, issue or another, uh, and Pat clearly is on that. So I just I you, you know they. It's like the nonpartisan is silent now in the in the description of of ledge finance. It's not that ledge finance is nonpartisan; it's just that they get they get all of the resources of the legislature to advocate one position, right? Um, and it's the position that some of the that, that the leadership agrees with, but. Uh, but it's not the position that's in the best interest well, of all it, Alaskans. Right, and it's almost like the definition of nonpartisan. I mean, it's kind of changed. You know, it's not necessarily about party. I mean, really, and I've said this before, you know, it's not about Democrat and Republican anymore. It's about larger government versus smaller government. It's about public sector versus private sector. And that really seems to be where the dividing line is these days is, you know, which do you favor more, a private economy or a public economy, a larger government or a smaller, more efficient government? And that seems to be where the quote unquote partisan lines are being drawn now. Well, and I think it's a little bit more than that, even Michael, even that, Michael. I think it's also how does it affect me? 
how does it affect my income bracket? Uh, how does it affect the income bracket of my district? Um, and I think that is is a is a clear dividing line. You know, when you get Natasha and Kathy, Kathy who represents the most wealthy, the the, the wealthiest Senate district in the state, um, and and Jennifer who represents the wealthiest House district in the state. When you when you get them, uh, when you involve them in the process, they're saying, hey. Top 20. Well, I don't want the top 20 percent to pay this. Let's use let's use a mechanism that pushes the cost to somebody else. Uh, and the PFD is a very convenient mechanism, unfortunately, for pushing costs to middle and lower income Alaska families. And they're saying that I mean, they're saying that notwithstanding the fact that ICERS told us cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. They're nonetheless pushing this line uh, to protect themselves. So I think it's more than simply big government versus small government. Um, uh, uh, private sector versus public sector. I think there's also uh, uh, an income class uh, uh, aspect of this that, uh, that, 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 that is clearly a dividing line and clearly creates a, a partisan divide between those who, who are trying to protect the top 20% and those who are trying to spread this burden. And it's a burden, but trying to spread this burden more broadly. Uh, Brad Keithley, final thoughts here as we wrap up here. Well, it's going to be a long session. I agree with you on that, but I but I think we've seen the end of it already in the in the first two votes, um, and uh, and and it's going to be a lot of noise uh, as that plays out. One can hope that uh, that there's a, a an awakening somewhere during the session, but I think people are fairly well entrenched uh, in in where this is going, and I think it ends up, as I say, uh, in another uh, uh, ad hoc PFD cut at the end of it to balance the budget and. Uh, and and no long-term solutions. All right. Well, Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. As I said, we always appreciate it. Folks can go out. you got the new revamp of your website. Everything else is uh, all beautified now, and you've got everything in one spot. Where do folks go to find you? Uh, the website is AK4FORSB, uh, and that's sort of acting as a hub now for all the various things we do, the newsletters that we put out both on a national level and a state level, uh, the YouTube uh, stuff that we put out, the, the the podcast that we put out of these discussions and other things. Uh, you can you can access it all through uh, AK4SB. All right, Brad Keithley, thank you so much for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.